Yeah, online, I hope you believe that too. You may be seated. And I just got to testify this morning that my name is Dave Anderson. And I unfortunately used to be a sin follower. And because of that, I hurt a lot of people relationally. But I stand before you as a child of God now. He has changed my life completely. And so I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and that dictates how I live in every situation. I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and that dictates how I interact and treat the people that God puts in my sphere of influence. I want everyone here to know and online that I am only about one movement, and I will only be about one movement, and that is the way of Jesus Christ. And I will build my life upon one truth, and that is God's truth. That is God's word that came to us in the flesh of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will join me in being able to testify in the same way. This morning, we're going to talk about an issue that really has life and death consequences for us. And I can't overstate the, the seriousness of the issue, and I hope that you will grasp the seriousness of this issue, not by my words, but by the word of God that we are going to, to read and we are going to, to work through this morning. And the issue concerns living in right relationship with each other. As we have learned a few weeks ago, and we've been talking about the last few weeks, God created us to live in right relationship with each other. It is a fundamental truth that I want to make sure that we understand. This is the way that God created us to live. And then God gave us the choice of whether we wanted to live in a right relationship with each other or not. That is, whether we wanted to follow God or not. And the problem in our world is, is that broken relationship has become the norm. Broken relationship has, has now seems ordinary and routine and acceptable. In our world, sin is intent on keeping us in broken relationship. And we can see that. We can see that on, on we can see that when we watch the news. Come on, be real, right? Like whether you watch it on TV or whether you see it on social media, it's all about polarization. We have to be enemies. We can't have, if we have a different view, then that means you are my enemy. And, and the world wants us to dehumanize each other because when we dehumanize each other, it's easier for us to write each other off and treat each other in an inhumane way. Are, are you with me this morning? And what irks me the most, I mean, what breaks my heart on this broken relationship stuff is that broken relationship has infiltrated into the church, into Christ's body, as evidenced by the numerous church splits that happen each and every year, as evidenced by people leaving one church and going to another because of some tiff or disagreement that they had with their pastor or someone else in the church. This broken relationship has infiltrated the church in such a way that it just, it, it, it pains me that people actually stop coming to church altogether. I want nothing to do with God because of some unresolved conflict. And, and we can look at stats. It's, it's, it's really unfortunate this, that this broken relationship has, has infiltrated the church because the, they say that the divorce rate among people that say they actually go to church and people that don't go to church is almost the same. It makes my heart weep. That's not right. That's not how God created us to be. Simply put, and, and, and I want to make this clear right off the bat, and it, it may sound a little odd. You may be like, no, 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 no way, Pastor Dave, don't. No, it can't be true. This can't be true. But stay with me as we walk through this, and I think that you'll see that it is true. Whether or not we are going to have eternal life with God, eternal relationship with God depends on whether we live in right relationship with each other. Let me say it again so you can sit with us. Whether or not we have eternal life, eternal relationship with God depends on whether or not we live in right relationship with each other. There are no ands, ifs, or buts about that. 
our, listen, our ability, our ability to live in right relationship with each other is dependent on whether or not we've been transformed by God. That is, whether we're a God-controlled person or a sin-controlled person. And it is life and life's, I'm going to say, daily choices and situations that reveal whether we have been transformed by God or not. That is, whether we are a God-controlled person or not. Are you with me this morning? In our story for today, our, our main character is presented with this, this life situation that, uh, that, that is stemming from, interestingly enough, stemming from a worship experience where he is forced to, to determine whether he's going to reconcile his feelings of anger towards his brother so that he can remain in right relationship with his brother or, or whether he's going to break relationship with his brother and thereby break relationship with God. So when we break relationship with someone in our life, hmm, think and take this in. We then break relationship with God. Let's pray. Oh God, please prepare us to receive your truth this morning. Open our hearts and our minds. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us to convict us, to open the scales, pull them back on this whole concept of living in right relationship. Your way, God. We we, we may have some blinders. We may have put up some blinders, and I'm asking that your spirit convict us, and then I'm asking that your spirit remove those blinders from us so that we can really see the purity and the beauty of your truth this morning, so that we may become a people of your truth, so that we may live in right relationship with everyone that you put in our sphere of influence. In your mighty name we pray and ask, amen. Our story... It's in, it's in, we're going to be in Genesis uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. If you want to pull out your Bible or if you want to pull out your, your phone and, 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 get, and, and, and look on it there, I'm going to be reading from the NIV translation. And if, oh, we don't have Bibles, do we? We don't have Bibles in the front because we took that all out because of COVID, right? Is that it? Okay, I was going to say, if you want to take one, you want to mark it up, you can. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 4, beginning verse 1. And, 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 and this passage begins, um, I don't know how else to say it, but I think it begins quite nicely. It begins this way. Adam made love to his wife Eve. I'm glad someone was listening. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. So two brothers have brought sacrifices to God. One sacrifice was accepted and one sacrifice was rejected. Why? Well, we're not told why. There's nothing on the face of this text that tells us that Cain did anything wrong for God to reject his sacrifice. So I have to wonder, was there a heart issue here? We don't know. Only God knows the heart. But something something had run amok here. What we are told, however, is that Cain became very angry and depressed because his sacrifice was rejected and his brother Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Now he's forced to wrestle with these feelings of anger and depression. But hear me on this. This is a very important, very important point. As we in our own life wrangle, wrestle with maybe anger, depression, or, or maybe feelings of jealousy, towards somebody or envy towards somebody. And as we're wrestling with that, I want you to hear this because this is is what what we're going to learn in this text is that God was with Cain. Cain was not left alone to deal and work through these feelings. God was right there with him. God is ever present in our lives. This is what we're told in verse six. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Does it bother anybody here 
that God appears to be using this situation to test Cain's allegiance. Well, the fact of the matter is, as we read these stories of the Bible, God uses various situations to see how a person's going to respond, whether they're going to respond in a God-controlled manner or a sin-controlled manner in this particular situation. That is, God's looking to see and to test their true allegiance. Is it to God or is it to something else that is, that is sin? And we see this in the stories even of Adam and Eve. We'll see it in the story of Noah. We'll see it in the story of Abraham and Moses, and King Saul, and King David, and, 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 and the Israelites as a whole, and even Jesus, who was tested for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. You see, life is full of daily choices and situations that reveal whether we've given our allegiance to God or to something else. It is whether we are a God-controlled person or a sin-controlled person. And this allegiance question is being played out here in the, consta, in the context of brotherly relationship. Like everyone else, Cain has two choices on how he's going to respond in this situation. One, he can respond in a, in a God-controlled way by reconciling his feelings of anger towards his brother and then, and then living in right relationship, continuing to live in right relationship with his brother, or two, he can respond in a sin-controlled way, break relationship with his brother, and then break relationship with God. And, and as he wrestles with this, these feelings on how he's going to proceed, what choice he's going to make, God makes it very clear that, that Cain's enemy... Sin, it's not Abel. God makes it very clear that, that, that Cain's enemy, sin, is formidable, but overcomable. I want you to hear that. Our enemy, sin, is formidable, but it's overcomable. First, it's very important that, that we see how God defines sin in this context. God does not define sin as breaking rules. God defines sin here as an aggressive force that, that's, that's waiting to ambush Cain as it crouches at Cain's door. The second thing that God makes clear is, is, that, is that sin desires to have Cain, but not in a healthy way. Sin desires to have Cain so that sin can dehumanize and then destroy Cain, as well as Cain's potential victim, his brother Abel. Sin wants Cain to view his brother as a competitor. He's not my brother. He's not you. He's my competitor. And when we view people in a dehumanized way, it's easier for us to write them off and put them to the side and expunge them from our lives. Are you following me here? And then third, God makes it very clear that sin can be ruled I love that. I don't know who's, who's, who's reading that, but it's a nice voice. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mona. I appreciate you being here today. That's all right. We got audio Bible. I love it. I'm glad you're in the Word. I'll give you kudos on that. It's still talking. So, so the third point is, is that sin can be ruled. God provides a powerful, positive statement here, here to, to Cain. He says, you must and you can rule over sin. You must and you can. God's statement here... <laughs> is an invitation, it's an encouragement, it's a promise to, to Cain and to us that sin need not be our master. Sin need not control our lives. We not only can resist sin, but we can rule over it. We can shut it down. How? By following God's way. And God enables us to do that if we will 
ask, seek, and knock for God's power. So I want to ask you this question. Do you believe that with God's power... Hey, that's okay. Take care of that. Man, it just seems like we just... We're just rocking this morning, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, what else are you going to do, right? You know what I mean? I love and I hate technology, right? I mean, hey. <laughs> All right, let me take a breath and see where we are. Ah, uh, okay. All right, here we go. I'm back to the question. <laughs> do you believe, I do right now, do you believe that with God's power, you can say no to sin. Otherwise, we'd just be a bunch of sinning robots, right? I mean, you, you may hear someone say, oh, you know, I've been saved by God's grace. That's true. But unfortunately, I have to sin in word, thought, and deed every single day of my life. That's nonsense. God gives us a choice. We're not a bunch of sinning robots. God gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to say no to sin and yes to God in all things. I like to put it this way, and I think every woman in the house will agree with me. No woman guy is going to say, well, I've been saved by God's grace, but I'm going to sin in word, thought, and deed every day, so I'm going to look at porn every day, but, you know, I still love you. You just got to suck me because that's just the way I am. No, that's nonsense. God will give you the power through the Holy Spirit to say no to sin and yes to God in all things. We are not a bunch of sinning robots. And the question for us is which way are we going to choose? Are we going to follow the God way or are we going to follow the sin way? What say you? So for Cain, that's to wrestle. Instead of, instead of Cain asking God, hey, why didn't you accept my sacrifice? What, what, what's up here? What, what am I supposed to learn here? What, what am I supposed to change? How, how do you need to change something in my life? Instead of reconciling his feelings of anger towards his brother, we're told this in verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Sin won the battle here. Sin convinced Cain that Abel was nothing more than a competitor that needs to be eliminated from his life. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, Cain replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer to that question is, is yes. You are your brother's keeper. This is the way God created you to be. He created you and created us to live in right relationship with each other, to have each other's best interest at heart. You have his back, he has your back. When he's down, you pick him up. When you're down, he picks you up. That's how we are to live in right relationship with each other. Are you guys with me here? But when we view each other as competitors, bad things happen. Man, I used to live that way. I remember when I was in college playing college football. I actually, my freshman year, I was so mature. I just wanted to be on the field that I actually hoped that, that, that another receiver would make a mistake or drop a ball so that I could get more playing time. Is that pathetic? I mean, that's pathetic. It was all about me. I didn't care about the team. I have to confess that. I lived, I was a different type of guy. When I was in the law field, I actually hoped that colleagues would blow a case or miss something. Why? Because I viewed them as a competitor. And if they failed, then it made me look better. And so I wished for their demise. That is living in broken relationship. That's just nasty. That's evil. I don't know if any of you can relate with that. But that's not the way God created us to be. And when, and when Cain said this, when he said, am I my brother's keeper, Cain is really refusing to acknowledge that he was created to live in a right relationship with his brother. He was actually refusing to acknowledge and just disagree and just reject the way God created him to be. So hear me on this. When we break relationship with someone, we are rejecting the way God created us to be. Are you guys with me here? Then verse 10, the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, 
Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So Cain has been sentenced to be a fugitive. And get this, because Cain refused to live in right relationship with one of God's creations, Abel, God's creation is no longer going to respond to Cain. Oh, wow. Hear me on this. Living in broken relationship, choosing to live in broken relationship, has consequences that we would never dream of for our life. We can't even see the impact of that choice, but we will experience it. Are you with me? Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me, that is there are other people living out there besides Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, okay? Whoever finds me will kill me. Interestingly, the murderer now fears being killed. The murderer now seeks mercy. The murderer, the sinner, has no resources of his own to avoid his plight. And so the murderer places himself defeat at the mercy of of the life giver, his creator, God. And this is what God says, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. In response to Cain's plea for mercy, God gives Cain a mark, which shows both guilt and grace. The reality of our guilt and God's grace come together in this story. Hear me on this. Guilt is met with judgment. But even the guilty one is met with surprising grace. So I have to ask, are there any Cains here? <laughs> any Cains here with us this morning? That is, is there anybody here who wants to eliminate someone, whack someone, <laughs> because of some tiff or disagreement? Any, anybody here? Okay, oh, we got a couple of people that are honest, right? We had one last night. I talked to her after the service. I may share that. But I assume that most of us don't want to just kill, I mean, like, actually take a knife or take a club or just beat someone to death. Although we may have feelings of anger and hate and bitterness towards someone, I'm going to assume that no one actually wants to, to take a gun and just blow, just blow somebody, just, just eliminate someone, right? If we do, let's talk afterwards, please. Okay, let's pray through on that one. <laughs> although, we, although we may we say uh, we, 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 would, we, we would never do that, we would never want to eliminate, just, or just crush someone. I, I wonder how much, how many of us really, really may want to or think about murdering someone. Huh. Over a, a worship or a church squabble like Cain. We say no. 
But let's, let's, let's not distance ourselves too, too far from this story. Jesus eliminates a- any false feelings of religious superiority by, by equating selfish anger and harsh words with murder in Matthew chapter 5. Why? Because all of them, murder, selfish anger, harsh words, hate, bitterness, they all result in the same thing, broken relationship with another God creation. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry, and we're talking about selfish anger here, not righteous anger, selfish anger here. That anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, that is you good for nothing, is answerable to the court. And the court they're talking about here is the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. And then come and offer your gift. Why? Because if we're not living in right relationship with each other, if we're not getting along with each other inside and outside the church, then our worship and our interaction with God becomes meaningless. Are you with me here? Living in right relationship with people is necessary if we're going to live in right relationship with God. You should don't say it that way. Let me say it that way again. Living in right relationship with people is necessary if we're going to live in right relationship with God. Living in right relationship with God enables us to live in right relationship with other people. And, and, and the tangible evidence of whether we have been transformed by God is whether or not we live in right relationship with each other. Are, are you following me here? And so when we, when we have that, when we just can't, like, when I could not live in right relationship with people, when I viewed people as a competitor, man, it's a hard issue. I'm not right with God. He's not my Lord and Savior. I am not a God follower. I am a sin follower, or I should say I'm a me follower. Are you guys following me this morning? So and, and when you think about it this way, eternal life, eternal relationship with God is linked to us being reconciled to each other, which then is linked to how we love each other. And the Apostle John talks about that in 1 John in chapter 3, beginning of verse 11. John says this, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you, because the world's sin does not want us to live in right relationship with each other. The world's sin wants to cause and perpetuate a broken relationship between us. Why? Because broken relationship is the complete opposite of how God created us to be and to live, which is in right relationship. Continuing in verse 15. But we, but we know that we have passed from death to life. That is, we've passed from living a, a life controlled by sin to a life controlled by God because, get this, because we love each other. That's the proof in the pudding. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister, that is a fellow believer, is a murderer. Anyone who hates is a murderer. And you know that no murderers have eternal life in them. So what does it mean then to love one another? Isn't that the question? Well, John continues, verse 16, this is how we know what love is. 
Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So, so, you know, I was talking to someone, they're saying, well, the world just uses the term love. They don't know what it means. They don't know what, what love means, and we throw that word around loosely. You guys hear me. When I talk about Jesus' love, you hear me say these, these phrases almost every time because I want it flowing off our lips. And, and this is where I, I, I get what I say is from this passage here. What is this Jesus' love that we're talking about? Well, it's a love of sacrifice for the sake of others. It's a love of action for the benefit of others. It's a love of forgiveness that lets go of all past wrongs. I mean, Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, and Jesus not only lets go, but Jesus just blots it out, doesn't remember, or doesn't bring our sins up anymore. And then I love the way this verse, the next sentence of this verse, I, I love it. I'm going to read it starting at the beginning. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then I love this. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That is, we are to live with a, a love of sacrifice for their sake, a love of action for their benefit. We live with a life of forgiveness. Uh, and that means we're not going to bring up how our spouse may have wronged us three years ago. We're not going to let that divide us anymore. Because we're a God-controlled person, not a me-controlled, sin-controlled person. Are you, guys, are you guys with me? And then, and then verse 17, I love it. It gives a practical application of what this love looks like. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? We were blessed so that we could bless other people. We were loved so that we can love other people. We were forgiven so that we can forgive other people. Are you guys with me here? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This text in 1 John forces us to acknowledge that we can never love each other like Jesus Christ loves us if we have not reconciled any ill will, any hate, any bitterness, that we may have towards someone else. It's impossible. We can't hate and love at the same time. We can't wish that person's demise and then also wish their best interest at the same time. It's one or the other. And God has enabled us to live in a reconciled relationship with everyone in our sphere of influence. God has enabled us to live in a right relationship with everyone in our sphere of influence. And he's done that in two real ways. By first reconciling us to God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, who showed us the way, who showed us how to live, who then paid the price for our sin, who died and then rose victorious over sin and death, so that whoever believes in him does not need to live in broken relationship forever. That's hell. But can live in right relationship with God and with everyone else forever and forever and forever. And then the second thing that God did to enable us to live in right relationship with each other is God gave us God's Holy Spirit who gives us the power to choose reconciliation over continued broken relationship. Are you with me here? So I say, reconcile. And live. Reconcile and live. The opposite is not good. Don't reconcile and die. So reconcile that relationship with your neighbor. Reconcile that relationship with your coworker or your colleague in school. Again, the evil one wants you to, or that teammate, the evil one wants you to see that coworker or that, that, that colleague or, 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 or that uh, teammate as a competitor. No, they're a beautiful creation of God. They've been created in God's image. And if they're not following God yet, God wants, you, wants to use you to help introduce that person to this God that's changed everyone in your life. So go reconcile that relationship so that you both can live. Are you with me? 
reconcile that relationship with that spouse who has broken trust with you in ways that you never could have imagined. Reconcile that relationship with your son or your daughter, your mom or your dad. Life is too short. Reconcile and live. But Pastor Dave, they won't accept my reconciliation attempt. Make the attempt. And if they refuse, it's on them. You are freed. You've given up that bitterness, that hate that you may have towards them. You're not longer living in bondage anymore. And the reality is, is that some relationships may never, ever be able to be the way they used to be. But there still can be reconciliation from your perspective. Are you following me here? So who here wants to reconcile and live. Yeah. And if you want to raise your hand, that's great, but here's what I want you really to do, is go do it. Go live it. Go make that attempt. Go humble yourself. Go die to self by being the first one to apologize. I'm sorry, we're at odds. I don't like being sideways here. I know I may have said something that may have hurt you. Please forgive me. Take the first step towards reconciliation and trust that God will take care of the rest. Are you following me? Will you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Oh God, I have, I have a confession to make. I've harbored bitterness in my heart. I haven't loved others the way that you have loved me. And I have resented certain people, you know, God, in my life because I thought they were better than me. And um, I, I, I just got to confess that and, and say I'm sorry. And, and I'm glad that you've changed the way that I'm, that I'm living and and I'm asking for, on behalf of anybody here who may be feeling that same way, to please forgive me of living that way. I need your help to forgive them because some of these folks have actually really hurt me, God. So I need to forgive them as you've forgiven me. And so I'm just stating here affirmatively that I forgive those people in my life who have caused me pain. And God, I don't just want forgiveness with a brother or a sister or a mom or dad, man. I, I, want, I want reconciliation in that relationship. They're my blood. I recognize that you've created them in your image and that they're special and that they're beautiful. Please help me to see them that way. You've created them with a purpose too. Help me to help them live out their purpose. Help me to love them with the unconditional love that you love me, God. Forgive me, God, again, for the times that I have not valued them. Please, God, oh, please, restore this relationship. I want to be reconciled with them so that we can live the way that you've created us to live in right relationship with each other for the best interest of each other. In your mighty, life-giving name, we pray and ask, amen. Will you stand with me this morning? And I just, I think it's, and our worship leader, Ashley, just thought it would be a great way to end in giving God a hallelujah for everything that God has done for us, the way God has reconciled us to God and then reconciled us with everyone in our life.